All right, next slide, please. Thanks, Seth was really proud of this one. <laughs> and um, so yeah, we're coming to you from Brown Brownfield Broadcasting Network. And so today's agenda is who wants to be a Brownfield millionaire? Um, and uh, we're really looking forward to today's webinar and I hope that you will find it both uh, entertaining and helpful. Next slide, please. All right, so my name is Katie. I am the assistant director here at the for the technical assistance to Brownfield pro, um, program here. And again, as Becca said, we are based at um, West Virginia University. So I'm kind of the, the tab lead and we are responsible for helping those of you throughout EPA Region 3. And so um, we help with a variety of Brownfield questions um, from uh, um, starting out your Brownfield process until trying to help you navigate through throughout um, actually if you have an EPA Brownfield grant. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that later, but I'm really happy to have you all here today. And you've got a wonderful team here and I'm gonna let them in, in, let each person on our team introduce themselves. Hey, I'm Ray Moeller, uh, Brownfield Assistance Center, focused on downtown redevelopment, but also uh, striving to win that Emmy for uh, hosting such a great show. Looking forward to interacting with the team and the audience. Hello, everyone. I am Seth Cardwell. I'm the Community Development Associate on the team. I've been here for going on eight months. My background's in public administration, so I graduated in May of last year with my master's in that. Um, this whole presentation and the idea of the game show format was my thought child, and my role on the team is being both Katie's henchman to WVU TAB and technical assistance to Brownfield communities, as well as being her favorite thorn in her side, so... All right, and you already know me, Becca Phillips, and I don't believe we have Carrie Staten, our director on the call, but she is always willing and available to help. So move on to the next slide. Thanks, Becca. So just again, a little bit about us. We, um, again, the EPA Region 3 includes West Virginia, Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and DC. So we are uh, we work closely with the EPA to provide technical assistance for communities throughout this region uh, to help navigate the brownfield process. All of the assistance that we provide is free. And again, that can include starting out in, in the brownfield process, trying to understand what is a brownfield, how many sites may you have in your community, and uh, taking you through the process of trying to understand how can you start to clean up and redevelop those properties. And then if you ultimately do apply for and receive EPA Brownfield uh, grant funding, we can help you um, administer that, that grant itself. So there are a variety of ways that we can help. And that includes um, webinars like today's all about leveraging resources. And so uh, again, we hope that you'll enjoy today's format because um, when it comes to leveraging resources, it's, it's, it is an incredibly important piece of, of putting together your process, or your project and actually bringing it to fruition. And so we hope that our friends here at Brownsville will be able to give you some inspiration. Also, again, we can help with grant writing assistance, reviewing grants, um, and then we also can help with actually identifying brownfield sites in your community with the inventory process. Uh, we can answer any questions and we can also try to connect you or do to connect you, not just try, but connect you to those who may be a little more knowledgeable. Next slide. So we would love to introduce you to um, our willing um, guests here today, and these folks are from the community of Brownsville, and so we find all the work that they have going on there very inspirational, and they've got so much progress going on there, and I would love for each of them to introduce themselves, and um, hope you learn a little bit more about them and their community throughout this webinar. All right, Andrew, take it away. Hi, everybody. I'm Andrew French. I'm the executive director of the Fayette County uh, Redevelopment Authority. So we represent uh, 42 different municipalities 
uh, throughout the county and uh, obviously hold a very special place in our heart for uh, Brownsville Borough. Hi everyone, I'm Muriel Nettle. I'm the Executive Director of the Fayette County Chamber of Commerce and the Brownsville Area Chamber of Commerce. That's an affiliate organization of ours. Um, born and raised in Brownsville, my parents were business owners in the community. And so, although I represent businesses throughout Fayette County, I have a kind of a special place in my heart for Brownsville and am really excited about the things that are happening there. And I'm Joe Barantovich. I am um, with the Perennial Project in Brownsville. Uh, it's a four-year-old entity at this point uh, who got involved with um, community service and trying to, uh, you know, as, as, as we say, is, is, is in the English department at the old high school that I, I, I used to teach at, uh, we're trying to make Brownsville more better. And I'm glad that I have um, on 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 video now Andrew and Muriel, um, you know, espousing their uh, you know their love for Brownsville. So uh, especially Andrew. All right, and I'm going to jump in here. We just wanted to make sure that before we get started, that those of you not familiar with Brownsville had an idea of what the community looked like. It is beautiful, situated on the Monongahela River in Pennsylvania. Um, Katie put together these slides and the folks from Brownsville sent us these pictures. Becca, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. And then we've also got some more pictures here of the historic Union Station that Brownsville is doing work on. That is a good project that we have and it will tie into the next slide on why Brownsville. So Becca, so. Why Brownsville? We chose to do this webinar with Brownsville because WVU TAB, our office, specifically Katie, in September of 2023, established a working relationship with the borough during a site visit. Their history characterizes the challenges of post-industrialization. Um, they have redevelopment initi initiatives that target preservation of cultural and historical, uh, historical sites in the area, as referenced the Union Station in the previous slide, and the borough has demonstrated success leveraging multiple resources, whether that be different types of federal funding, um, different sources of state funding, as well as funding from nonprofits and foundations in the area. So these are great people doing great work, and we really wanted to partner with them to highlight their story. So a little bit of context before we get started. Who wants to be a Brownfields millionaire? We have our run of show going. So we're going to give you the rules. And we have Ray, who is going to be the moderator from our team. Andrew, Muriel, and Joe will be the participants from Brownsville. Our approximate run time for the, Browns, uh, the Brownfield millionaire portion of this will be about an hour. And at the end, we're going to allow an additional 15 minutes for an open floor Q&A. That is where you all will be permitted to either unmute yourselves and ask questions or throw questions in the chat and we can monitor those as well. So how do we become a millionaire? All of the questions that we have for today's webinar are based off of information in the fiscal year 2024 request for applications for EPA cleanup grants. And our moderator, Ray, will ask the questions and keep time for us. The participants are allotted about a maximum of five minutes per answer. And we really want to emphasize that this is not a quiz. There are no right or wrong answers to this. Our goal is to learn from one another and to have fun because we do these types of webinars every year. We came up with the game show format to kind of make it a little bit more dynamic, a little bit more participatory. So that way you're not just sitting there listening to all of us drone about information on and on. We want to make it more dynamic and have some audience participation as well. So throughout, we have those questions for Brownsville and we also have Four, ask the audience or trivia questions that are related to cleanup applications as well. They provide supplemental information and they're situated in a way that they're related to either the previous or the upcoming question. Um, those will be prompted to you, the audience members, as a poll question. Becca will launch those and the audience members will be allotted 30 seconds for each answer submission. Those answers to those questions will be provided when polls close. Katie will take care of that for us. And these trivia are just intended, again, to give supplemental information related to the questions in the main show. Once we finish with the show, we'll have each of the three Brownsville participants do a one to two minute final pitch to the audience. The moderator will keep time on those. That's then when we'll move into our Q&A portion. 
and stay tuned because we will have slides with additional information and resources provided after the show and we'll also be including a summary of highlights um, of Brownsville's answers to the questions as well. So we hope you all enjoy. So Katie provided me with a golden microphone. I want to make sure it's working. Can you hear me? All right. And who wants to be a Brownfield millionaire? Um, we're going to ask that question today. We're going to give our folks a chance to answer from Brownsville. Okay. So A, I just love that Brownsville is going to be working with us on Brownfield's activity. I got it. That's just a cool tie in. And, uh, just for those of a certain age, I remember watching a TV like the one Seth put on the uh, early uh, slide with the rabbit ears and stuff. So if you're in that boat, uh, there's good good room in that club. Okay, who wants to be a Brownfields millionaire? Let's check out the next slide. Are you ready to risk it all? Well, what we're actually asking here is, are you ready to alleviate the risk of it all by getting yourselves an EPA cleanup grant and being able to address where there is risk in your communities and places that you want to redevelop. Becca, let's get to that first question. For $100,000 in monopoly money, I think is what we're actually <laughs> doing out, in your pursuit of funding, what specific brownfield impacts highlight the challenges faced by your community? So, so I think I'm going to take this one, Ray, to start things off. And uh, and I really appreciate the uh, the introduction. And Seth kind of gave a, a good overview of, um, of Brownsville. Uh, but just just to give a little more highlight, um, just regarding um, uh, Fayette County and Brownsville, um, it, even though we're going to talk about a lot of different challenges uh, that we have today. Um, Fayette County and Brownsville are really wonderful places. They've got rich culture, rich history. Uh, we've got a lot of tremendous uh, assets in, in both uh, the physical infrastructure, but also in the, in the people that uh, kind of have, have uh, embraced this community and grown up here uh, for, for generations. So, um, so I encourage you all to, to kind of explore uh, both Brownsville and uh, Fayette County. Uh, we again have a rich history, lots of recreation, some of the best whitewater rafting on the East Coast, um, the Great Allegheny Passage, and uh, I could go on and on. Uh, but Brownsville, um, again, had had some challenges, and I think these challenges, uh, in some respects, um, are not unique uh, to different communities uh, throughout the country. And I know we've got participants on this call uh, from, from really uh, all sorts of different communities, uh, both large and small. Um, and, and those challenges uh, relate to uh, both brownfields, but also uh, blight, also just aging infrastructure and aging community. Um, where Brownsville was uh, unique is in kind of how that decline kind of escalated starting in the, uh, the mid 1980s. Uh, and that was, that was Partly, again, due to the traditional um, things that we see in a lot of different communities where you've got kind of aging populations and just uh, different economic uh, climates. Uh, but what really escalated uh, the decline in Brownsville was you had a, a speculative um, investor. Uh, I don't know if investor is the, the right word. Uh, but they uh, began to acquire uh, a lot of different properties uh, throughout the community uh, based on a lot of different um, uh, schemes or premises, uh, one of which was uh, riverboat uh, gaming, uh, which is uh, Seth indicated in the beginning slide, Brownsville's located right on the Monongahela River. Uh, and at some point in time, there was thought that Pennsylvania might legalize riverboat gaming. Uh, so this this particular investor started buying up uh, large quantities of property, including uh, the entire kind of downtown area. I think at the end, uh, he he actually had acquired over uh, 100 properties uh, located throughout the community. And and again, a lot of the properties uh, they were acquired uh, based on speculation. 
Um, some of them were, were actually occupied. In fact, the one property that we'll focus on a little bit later, the Union Station building, uh, was an active office building and had lawyers and doctors and the railroad uh, company uh, all located in there. Um, but he uh, really, and that's why I indicated maybe investor wasn't the right term uh, because he really didn't invest anything in the properties and he kind of let them go uh, into uh, decline. So um, moving fast forward into the, into the late 1990s, early 2000s, um, Brownsville really was left with an empty downtown that contained uh, a lot of uh, vacant, dilapidated buildings. A lot of people referred to it as a, a ghost town. Uh, you had a lot of people also refer to them being held hostage uh, by this, um, this speculator. Um, and, and really, we were kind of at a loss in terms of, of how to address uh, these blighted structures, these brownfield structures. And these are, we, we qualify them as brownfields because they are, even though they're not the traditional, maybe industrial brownfield sites, uh, these were all commercial, very significant uh, commercial structures um, in the downtown. And so that, that was kind of the... Um, the, the challenge uh, that existed kind of again in the in the early 2000s was the um, um, was more the um, uh, the lack of investment in the town and then this controlling uh, factor that you had one property owner that controlled a lot of the properties and really wasn't willing to to do anything with Andrew is that your final answer? I think that's my final answer on this question. <laughs> oh, right. And that is a, a challenge that lots of small communities face. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting one. And I've not heard of somebody with over 100 properties. So that's a pretty darn good answer. Let me check with the judges. Oh, I, I think we're going to award the $100,000. Great answer <laughs> on the Brownsville. Andrew, good job. Oh, Becca, let's, let's go to the next question. For $250,000. For ten dollars, how do plans for reuse create a shared vision that connects local government with community needs? You want your government tied into whatever it is you're trying to undertake. What's your answer here? Yeah, and and so I I had on my notes that I'm going to tag team on this one with uh, Muriel and Joe, but I'll I'll start to to kind of expand again a little bit on the history of of uh, what happened again, starting in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Um, I think we, we quickly realized through different planning efforts at that time uh, that we needed to kind of take a more bold and aggressive stance on how we dealt with the blighted properties in Brownsville. So, so one thing that Brownsville um, had an abundance of, even though there wasn't a lot of um, investment in different projects um, or significant investment, um, there were a lot of plans because everybody wanted to plan something uh, for the community. And so one of those plans uh, at the time uh, was through the Appalachian Regional Commission uh, who, who funded a comprehensive kind of community strategic plan. And, and again, what came out of that by meeting with different businesses, meeting with different students, meeting with uh, just different community members was that um, the biggest impediment was the downtown area and how you dealt with the blight there. Um, and so that's when I think as a redevelopment authority, we um, uh, we worked with the community, with the borough council and the mayor at the time and kind of laid out a strategy as to how could we get more aggressive to, to really address the blight. And the, the big key was to get possession of the properties. Um, so we were fortunate um, at that time, I think it was in the mid 2000s, um, we had a, a governor, uh, Governor Rendell, who actually came to Brownsville. And I think he was maybe the, one of the first governors, at least within a, a, a several generations that actually came to the town. And, uh, and when Governor Rendell came, uh, he, uh, he pledged uh, the full support uh, of the Commonwealth. Um, and of course, our immediate ask to him is, we need $2 million. 
we need $2 million to get possession of the properties and really get a hold of them and start this, you know, this redevelopment project in order to deal with these brownfields. And uh, of course, they said, no, 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 you're not ready for that. You need to do more, more planning, more planning. Um, so we did. We did a, a, a comprehensive redevelopment plan. Uh, we undertook um, very aggressive code enforcement um, activities. Um, and and we, we did a lot of that. And at the end, uh, I think that, that process took about two years. And at the end of that, uh, we went back and they said, OK, what's the result? And we said, we need $2 million. And they gave us $2 million. And at the time, it was through a program called Growing Greener 2 uh, through the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And, uh, and that funding was state funding. So it didn't have all the federal ties to it uh, that can sometimes be a little bit cumbersome. Um, but it, uh, it, it gave us the flexibility in order to go in and do a traditional redevelopment project where we targeted uh, about 18 properties in the downtown area. And these were all 18 major commercial structures that were located in the downtown area. Uh, we targeted them for, for acquisition uh, and began that process. Um, so that's a little bit of the older background. I think I'll turn it over to Muriel and Joe to see if, if you have anything to add on maybe some of the more recent planning uh, that, that we are uh, undertaking in the borough. Muriel and Joe, pretty quick here. Mm -hmm. What do you got? Um, Joe, do you want to jump in with yeah. kind of... <laughs> no. ladies, ladies, ladies first always. So just be, before I, I talk even a little bit about that, one of the questions popped up in the chat, which I think was interesting, and it says it was like, how do you get local government to even care? Um, well, I think in this situation, you had a community that could do nothing because the downtown was completely under you know ownership of this person who who had no real desire other than riverboat gaming to do anything and allowed it to decline. So. Um, although I think it's different in other communities in, in Brownsville, the, that local government really had no choice. If the, if the community was going to move forward, was going to change, they had to become part of the conversation. Um, those same plans that, that Andrew talked about, those initial plans also created a little bit of controversy. And although we often think about that as a negative, um, it's not always a negative to have a little bit of controversy because it got more people involved. Even if they didn't like what was going on, they had an opinion, which is really important when you do community work. You know, you've got to have, you know, you've got to have really a, a broad conversation about who wants what and who doesn't want what, and so on. Um, as the plans move forward, the um, the the community be, became more involved and started to do some more work throughout throughout the town. And a really important component, which I think we'll touch on a little bit later too. Um, is that they got the school district involved and um, got some passionate kids involved through a program there, and that started to make make more change. I don't want to give away like more that we'll talk about <laughs> later, so I'll I'll pause right. there. Joe, wrap this up in a minute. What you got, my friend? All right. Uh, from my end, uh, at the printer project, I was a, a, a an original Bronzeville resident. Uh, moved away in 1980. Spent my career in Miami. Retired came back to town and uh, really was upset about the way the town looked, uh, realizing that, um, you know, me personally at, at that point is all it was, couldn't do anything about the buildings and the blight. Uh, there was no reason for the rest of the town to look impoverished. Uh, weeds growing up through the sidewalks, um, you know, the, those, those kinds of things. So basically what um, what I decided to do uh, was, I uh, mean, even before the, the thought of the perennial project even existed, was just to plant some flowers. Um, you know, it would make town a little bit uh, prettier. The, um, you know, maybe nobody cared but me, but at least when I drove through town, you know, I'd, I'd feel better. Um, so the first thing I did, as Muriel said, is I, I went to the school district. I'm an old football coach. Uh, the superintendent there is an old football coach. We kind of hit it off. And uh, he immediately jumped on board to, you know, to make this happen. Um, we had a, at that point a, a good city council who, um, who were behind, uh, you know, anything that the, that the public could do because you know, like everything else, their funding was, um, you know, was in dire shapes. 
So it became a, a community volunteer effort that just kind of was a grassroots thing that just grew organically um, through uh, organizations and clubs in town. Um, we went from planting flowers to uh, historical uh, historical scanning of, of properties that we thought you know may be um, doomed to uh, to to collapse. So, um, Ray, uh, I'm, I'm about to get I'm about to get uh, cut off. So, you are. <laughs> uh, yeah, and and I could talk for the next you know half hour about all the things that we've done. We'll get back to some of it later, and I'll, I'll save you the agony, Ray, of, of cutting me off. So I'm no, done. You guys. What you've made a great point of is how it takes a team to make this work. If any one person trying to go out, if you don't have the government, the school, the community clubs, uh, local folks like Joe, folks who really want to get after it. So you did a great job of framing that answer. And again, I think you get the full $250,000. That was a tremendous <laughs> answer. And it's a tremendous example of what makes these kind of things work in communities. I think now we're going to go to a uh, audience engagement thing. Is that right? That's right, Ray. So mm -hmm. everybody, um, you're about to have a poll pop up on your screen. And whoop, our first question for you is, which of the following are examples of in-kind resources that can be leveraged during the period in which the grant is active? Is it goods, services, labor, or all of the above? And keep in mind that everything that we're asking today and that we're doing the polls on are things that relate to EPA cleanup grant applications. And so um, these, all, these all apply. You got right. just a couple of seconds. And. Oh, <laughs> everybody got that right. It couldn't be all of those things, but yes, it can. And those all can apply towards the match that you need to provide for these cleanup grants. Great job, audience. Let's go to the next question for $400,000 and the monopoly money just keeps piling up. What specific reuse outcomes improve quality of life within the target area? How do we point that out? Who's, who's gonna give me that answer from Brownsville? So I can jump in on that again. So the, um, as, as we've kind of indicated, um, given the, the extreme blight that existed, um, that was probably the, the most significant um, output or outcome that uh, we were attempting to address was how do we how do we deal with the, the blight in the down primarily in the downtown area? Um, so that was our, our immediate um, success that we had was again, once we got possession of the properties was going in and addressing, the more severe blighted structures um, that existed. And so the, these are structures, even though you know, Brownsville has a rich history, it's actually on the National Register um, of Historic Properties um, with a number of contributing buildings, um, that historic district was severely compromised. And so a lot of these major commercial structures um, just were, it was infeasible to, um, to try to save them. And so a lot of them we identified um, that unfortunately we had to pursue uh, demolition. And so, and that that could be its own question or answer or whole webinar is, is how to deal with um, historic properties <laughs> and get the necessary approvals uh, that you need to, um, to kind of deal with them. Um, but, but we did, so that was a whole, whole different process. And I think that was the immediate outcomes that we had was, was through pursuing some of the demolition to address um, those those uh, severely blighted properties. Now, there were a number of other outcomes that came out of that because once we started to pursue that demolition, then people kind of, it kind of invigorated the community and they kind of saw kind of a different palette uh, that they were working with and they saw different uh, possibilities in terms of what could happen. And so I think um, either Joe or Muriel had, had referenced um, 
the engagement again of um, students, which was kind of unique because as I mentioned early on in the planning efforts in the um, early 2000s, we were dealing with a whole different group of students uh, in that planning effort that kind of spurred us to, to, to be more aggressive uh, in, in acquiring the properties. Well, now we were dealing with the next generation of students and uh, it was a group called Students in Action that actually wanted to um, engage and they wanted to do something to improve their community. And, um, and so I'll, I'll touch on it briefly, but they, they originally um, had, had wanted to actually um, redo a, it was a, it was an old trailer that sat next to the library and they, they had this vision of doing a, a community stage. And so they wanted to take this trailer and revamp it and, and kind of make it into this, this stage for different presentations. Um, well, unfortunately, um, I had that stage, I had that trailer removed because it was a blighted structure. And so it was one of the early demolitions that we kind of tried to clean it up. Uh, but what also happened simultaneously is we were, we were had plans on demolishing uh, some major commercial structures in the core downtown uh, square, the kind of main square of the, the community. And so working with those students, uh, they were able to uh, energize the community uh, we went after uh, different um, state and federal grants, uh, and we actually put together about $370,000 to do uh, what we call the Snowden Square Stage Project. Uh, and they, they were able to, to actually leverage uh, a lot of different resources from private foundations, from private donations, uh, and whatnot. So that was, that was kind of one uh, unanticipated outcome that kind of occurred just from us getting possession of the properties and dealing with the, the immediate blight. Um, another outcome that happened was at the same time that the, the stage was being constructed right across the street in the main downtown area, there was a group of buildings that we had acquired and we were approached by a private developer out of Pittsburgh that wanted to do some senior, uh, senior housing. And so uh, they were. They actually came in again as a redevelopment authority. We assembled the property. Uh, we helped with the demolition of three of the properties, uh, and then they went after uh, low-income housing tax credits uh, to do an $8.5 million investment uh, to create a new senior housing project. So you had both the combination of uh, the stage project, the new community, the new town square, community square, and then you had. Uh, the new housing development that brought people uh, downtown. And with that, I'm going to tag team a, a phone a friend with Joe and Muriel to see if they want to talk about any other outcomes that kind of kind of have happened um, uh, within our uh, initiative here. So one of the things that I think it's important to talk about here, um, Andrew mentioned it, but I, I guess this tends to be my role sometimes. Um, all of this, I, I feel like we talk about this sometimes and it, it makes it sound like it was easy. Um, Andrew, you really make it sound like it was easy um, because we did have, and do to this day have um, some historical preservationists, you know, coming up at us on a regular basis because, you know, we are changing, changing the community. These were as downtown, a set of contiguous buildings that um, are so rare in downtowns anymore and having to do demolition. But the, um, the, the, the things that I would say are important when you have these conversations in your community with people is that, you know, to a great extent, these were, these are blighted buildings, but they were truly a safety hazard. Um, and so, you know, even when we think about, and this seems kind of minor in the big picture, but I think it's important that I know we're close on time, but I think it's important to mention this. So in this community, you know, we are, we are, um, we are protected by, so to speak, you know, volunteer fire departments. So when we think about everybody, oh, we've got to keep that building. One of the things that was always first and foremost was what if something would happen in those buildings? People wanted to get in them and they wanted to go through them. Or, you know, what if God, you know, God forbid there was a fire in one of those buildings? You know, it's our volunteer firemen who are family members who we were concerned about you know, it's truly safety issues. So it's important to think about historic preservation and keeping what you can, but it's also important to remember that you've got to keep safety to forefront. Um, and so we've kept, you know, we've been very mindful of that, you know, in the process. Um, 
The other thing that we try to bring home on a regular basis in that conversation is Bronzeville does have this absolutely incredible history, like just just absolute tradition woven, you know, into the fabric of that community. It's amazing. And we want to honor that history for our children, but we also want to be able to keep our children there. And that means that we have to move forward. So that's one of the things I say all the time is when you have these communities, we need to honor the history, but be able to move forward as well. So not really kind of connected, but extra pieces there. And and Ray, I know we're really close on time. <laughs> Um, Joe answered one in the in the chat on how the property was acquired, but again, uh, the the multiple angles are are the important point of of how Brownsville and and the support partners um, approach this and the historic properties. Yeah, we deal with that in every small community around the state, um, and there are realities that we have to face and we have to provide a new answer. So. I am assuming that's your final answer on this one. And yeah, we're keeping them on time because they've got so many good questions up ahead to that we want to make sure we get good answers on. And the judges all agree that that is a fantastic uh, $400,000 answer. So for $550,000, it just keeps growing. If EPA funding is not sufficient to complete the cleanup activities, how will your community leverage opportunities to clean up the target area? Yeah, and so that's um, that's where our expertise has been, is leveraging resources, right? So we, we actually have never received an EPA uh, grant <laughs> yet, um, but we, um, so we, we, um, we've actually been pretty successful at um, leveraging a lot of different local, state, and federal resources. And I mean, I could go down through the, the litany. I mentioned the Growing Greener too, which was funding through the Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development. We've leveraged funding um, through the Community Development Block Grant Program. We've um, used uh, funding through, I mentioned the LIHTC, um for housing, uh, you know, that program. Uh, we've use funding through DCNR, through private foundations. Uh, we we tend to try not to leave any stone unturned. So um, also the, the local investment, I think, um, has been pretty significant. Uh, Fayette County um, has a number of different resources um, that we've established, um, one of which is a, is a um, demolition fund uh, that we were able to use to help us with the, a lot of the demolition. Uh, Muriel works heavily with a lot of funding through our uh, tourism promotion agencies, so they've uh, contributed a lot to um, um, to the initiatives. Um, I think too, and, and Muriel touched on it. I kind of touched on it a little bit too. Is is and and it wasn't an easy process um, because we we kind of realized that. Um, I mean, again, we acquired all these properties using eminent domain, which isn't always popular, but. But if there was ever a case for eminent domain, Brownsville was it. Um, the next difficult process that we had was, okay, where do we put our resources? Because now that we've acquired these properties, uh, we know that Brownsville isn't the same as it was 50 years ago. Um, the population was different. Um, the, the economics were different. Uh, the commercial structure was different. There just wasn't a need for as many buildings or as many properties uh, that, that existed during uh, Brownsville's um, heyday. And so we we that's when we kind of came up with a strategy that we need to deal with the, the blighted structures. And unfortunately, a lot of that was through uh, demolition. Uh, but there was one property that, that I think everybody kind of came to a consensus that said, we really want to try to preserve this because it it was kind of the most historic structure um, in the downtown area. And that's the Union Station building that I think there were some pictures of early on, uh, which was kind of the main um, train um, uh, railroad building uh, that existed. As I mentioned, it, it, it actually was probably one of the last buildings that was occupied uh, in the downtown uh, before everything became vacant. Uh, and it, it, it really served as kind of the hub of activity uh, in a lot of respects, having a lot of different uh, professional office buildings, some commercial space on the ground floor. And so that's where we kind of lean towards that being uh, where we wanted to try to see the most investment. And so that uh, has been our focus of, 
uh, when we have submitted EPA uh, requests uh, for assistance, uh, that's kind of been our main focus has been the um, the Union Station building. So I'll tag it over to Muriel and Joe to see if you want to add anything on that particular building or anything else. I can I can jump in here uh, quickly. Uh, and, and Ray, you're not even being subtle anymore with this you know, Bronzo <laughs> final answer. <thing. laughs> um, anyhow, you know, basically two two things I want to mention at this point. Um, we have as a community just continue to move forward and um you know the, the way we talk about it in our little group is just just continue to do the work um you know we we started with planting flowers and and really had no way to know exactly like where this was leading um but you know two things that have happened one is with regard to the union station um you know it, it's a building that we want to try to reclaim and repurpose, but no one was really sure if that was even possible at this point because it's been vacant for so long. Um, through some connections of ours, we got involved with the University of Pittsburgh School of Engineering to do some uh, senior projects. And as capstone projects, one of the first ones that we did was to have engineering students come in and and determine the structural dynamics of the building, whether it was even you know possible to save it if we if we were able to. Um, they came in and did a semester's worth of work looking at um, structural integrity and found that the old um, urban legends that everybody thought uh, were actually true that the the building was built um, so sturdily that it could actually you know it, it could actually you know have two more floors built on top of it. The building is structurally sound. It is a, a steel and concrete building, which gave us even more reason to try to uh, to go about getting uh, getting EPA grants to to get the start, uh, you know, to save it because we realized that no one entity was going to come in with ten million dollars and and save this building, and so we had to do it piecemeal. We had to start with getting it cleaned out, um, getting it ready for um, you know for development. Uh, the, the the new term is the uh, you know the uh, the the you know, and Muriel is going to correct me on this. I always get it wrong. The 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 white box kind of a vanilla. thing. The vanilla box. Vanilla vanilla <laughs> vanilla box. Thank you, Muriel. She always corrects me. And then one <laughs> other thing I want to mention, just real quickly, Ray, before you cut us all off. Um, <laughs> some of the buildings that got torn down that uh, Andrew got talked about because they became. Uh, a danger to the community. They, they were they were identified as as condemned by our mayor. Uh, the buildings came down um, through this continual process of just doing the work and moving forward. Um, we had a, a mini master plan uh, for the downtown area, and in that mini master plan, one of the things that that people talked about was they you know, they wanted another place to to gather. You know, we had the stage across the street, um, you know, that was moderately being used at that time. Um, but they talked about like, you know, a, a place to see outdoor movies, it's, you know, something along the river. Um, and so from that, um, we went out and got a bunch of grants from a bunch of different people, the giant corporation, EQT, the National Road, uh, DCNR, uh, Rivers of Steel that, uh, that, you know, we just kept, you know, and that's kind of the answer to this question. Yep. You know, you know, how, how did the community do it? They, you just, you just like, just keep moving forward. And, you know, and through that, you know, we have now a, 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 a space that is, um, you know, ready for, you know, community, you know, community activities. We have a movie screen that, um, you know, the first year that was, was there, we actually, I, mean, I don't know if I should put this on tape, yeah. but uh, we, uh, we, we showed a Steeler game down there. Not sure how that fed, fit in with the, uh, you know, with, with, with NFL rules, but, you know, but, but we did that on a Thursday night. Um, and just to continue to have activities. And, and, and basically, I just want to sum up with just keep moving forward. Just keep looking for projects, keep doing things. Um, and things will just, you know, you know just, just snowball on their own if you, if you do the work. So what we knew going into this uh, game show was that Brownsville has this amazing story. And there is, it's very, so difficult to encapsulate. And they're in the process of uh, EPA cleanup grant. You've got one in. And so... A lot of these answers, again, they've already, they've put to the to the real cause. So, you guys, your final answer, as always, is just amazing, and uh, you're going to get the full five hundred fifty thousand dollars. Becca, let's 
see what the next one holds. And guys, I really am going to ask you to try and give me those answers in a succinct fashion so we can get all of your uh, aspects accounted for. So once cleanup is completed, what opportunities are being leveraged to ensure that site reuse is achieved? And it sounds like you've already alluded to some of that. So yeah, give us your 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 brief answers on that, please. So yeah, maybe I'll, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Muriel. Nope. I was say maybe I'll jump in real quick on this one. And I wanted to mention that one of the things that we did in the process with the Union Station building, really with all of downtown Brownsville, but Union Station building primarily was we try to keep our um, local and state and federal um, elected officials in the conversation. So we actually invited um, Senator Casey here um, to Brownsville and walked him all over downtown Brownsville, um, helped him to fall in love with that community and the people, and then used that opportunity with him to talk about what an important keystone of the community that Union Station building is. And so, you know, once cleanup is completed, we, you know, we've got a long way to go to get to that. But um, we're we're working in prep for that now, um, you know, in creating a feasibility study, you know, in looking at, you know, what opportunities we have, what that could be used for. Um, but I think the important part of this whole conversation for Brownsville is that that Union Station building is like the key component um, to the much bigger project. And all of these pieces are moving at the same time. We didn't just focus on Union Station and leave the rest of the community, but there are probably, I don't know, Joe and I tried to count one time, I don't know, maybe nine different projects. Uh, Andrew, you probably... And we came about eight or nine different projects that are all moving in one way or another in the community together. Go ahead, Andrew. Right, right. Yeah, and and um, and also what's significant is the private investment that's occurred as well. So again, all this momentum that that we've kind of built with our different projects that we're pursuing uh, kind of has has gotten to that level. So so the and Muriel touched on it. So the um, so the current proposal that we have for the Union Station that we were hoping that at some point, you know, we might get some EPA uh, Brownfields investment. Uh, that's not the only source because it's obviously a very significant building, a very substantial building that's going to require a lot of resources uh, from a from a lot of different sources. Right. So. Um, so as Muriel indicated, we were fortunate to have um, Senator Casey uh, come. He encouraged us to actually apply for um, some appropriations funding. And so it was included. Um, of course, that's all pending uh, everything that's happening at the federal level. But uh, but we put in a request to get some uh, funding directly from the uh, FY24 appropriations. We also have a program in Pennsylvania called the Redevelopment Assistance Capital Program. Uh, at the state, and so Brownsville does have a line item uh, within that uh, proposal. That money has to be matched dollar for dollar. So again, the hope is that if you can get the appropriations, if we could get EPA funding, that those funding sources could be used to leverage some funding through um, through that redevelopment assistance capital program at the at the state. Uh, and then again, the myriad of other sources that we might get through an Appalachian Regional Commission, uh, private investment and, and anywhere else that we can uh, we can find to leverage the dollars. And we do, um, I guess, to this um, specific uh, pro, uh, question, um, again, we that's our expertise, right, is in terms of once the funding um, if once we are able to secure the funding, um, you know, we have a, a really strong track record uh, within our team uh, to be able to make sure that that those projects are completed to their fruition and, and that everything's successful. I think it's worth at least seven hundred thousand dollars to keep the uh, politicians involved. So great work. <laughs> great answer. And I'm going to take that as our final for that one for sure. And are we going to engage the audience again here, Becca? Yes, we are. Sorry. I muted myself. Um, so our second question for the audience, true or false, when submitting a grant application, the applicant must showcase how the anticipated reuse of the sites advances environmental justice. I 
I think that might be long enough for a true or false. We can make it work. All right. And it is true. We are to try and show how the broader good can come from whatever activity it is that we're undertaking. That will just be points in our favor if we can do that. All right, next question for Brownsville. Based on your knowledge or data, what are specific threats faced by sensitive populations in the target area? And how could you, and how could addressing these threats advance environmental justice? So taking a building upon that, that true or false and knowing that that's an aspect that we are trying to impact. Talk to us about that. I'm going to hand this over to Muriel to uh, to talk about <laughs> some of the sensitive populations that that we try to work with in Brownsville. I muted myself. Sorry. There you go. Um, Brownsville is a it's a unique community, um, but not not unique. I mean, there are there are lots of of these little communities around. We are not growing in population, um, at least at this point, um, also similar to many areas around here. Um, I'm going to answer this by saying, I think, I guess, reinforcing maybe what we what you've heard us say throughout this whole thing. Um, we're addressing the population in Brownsville by working with the population in Brownsville. So there's a little cautionary tale that goes along with a couple of the projects that happened earlier, um, way early, kind of back in the original plan days after the properties were um, obtained. And that is that folks came into the community and they kind of decided um, more or less what was best for the community. So these people came in and they said, you need this and you need this and you've got to do this and this should look like this and so on. The cautionary tale is when you're going to do this kind of community work, you have to involve the community. I know it sounds stupid. It sounds like the dumb moment, but it's so important and we see it happen. I watch it happen in other communities on a regular basis as well. How are we dealing with those sensitive populations? We pull them into the conversation. So Joe talked about the mini master plan. That mini master plan was created because they went into the community, brought the community together and said, it, it's kind of like the basics of placemaking. Like, this is your community. You are invested in it. You love it. You live here. What do you want to see? And the work that's being done in the community is based on what the community wants to have. That way there's investment. They want it to be there. They want it to look better. They want to be engaged in the process. So I guess it's kind of an easy answer to that is, we're dealing with those sensitive populations by including them in the conversation and making sure that the work we do reflects what the community actually wants. Obviously, we bring in the expertise that we don't have when needed, but we listen to what the community wants to see in order to make the change. That is a great answer. Joe, I feel like you have 10 seconds that you want to add to that. Oh, yeah. Try to be nice to me now, Ray. <laughs> um it 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 is it is the the the, the part that Muriel mentioned uh, that the getting multiple groups involved and uh, you know uh, trying to you know and sometimes you have to seek out uh portions of the community that maybe um you know are a little bashful or you know not engaged that um you know there, there's always someone who can who can find um you know a, a connection with that 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 specific group of people that you can use them to try to um, get them more involved in in the things that you're doing in town. That's kind of how we have been trying that's, to attack it. That's perfect. And it is an important part of the EPA cleanup grant application is to show how you're going to engage the community and that you've taken those steps. You guys, again, amazing answer and full award of the finances that mm -hmm. went with this question. You guys are blowing it away. It's amazing. Uh, let's engage the audience again, Becca. Excellent. Question number three. I'm going to launch. All right. True or false, EPA Brownfield grant applications will be evaluated only on how the applicant demonstrates a shared community vision for the redevelopment of Brownfield sites.
And the answer is. Share the results. And the answer is false. It's false. That is an important mm -hmm. aspect of it, but there is more to it. So it's just kind of a trick question. Of course, that's part of it, but we really need to, uh, it's, it's a broader aspect of answering that question. All right, next one for the Brownsville folks. 900,000, oh my goodness. When planning site reuse strategies, how will you incorporate community input and what specific roles will community groups play in the process? Again, I know you've touched on that. Just kind of bring it to the surface here a little bit, how they'll be more specifically involved. Joe, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, give me the tough one. <laughs> okay. Um, this, this whole thing, is, is, as you've heard throughout the course of the morning, is, is you know, the, the community-based. It is, it is bringing people together. Um, you know, to, to make sure that that happens. And we've, 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 we have done that um, because of the things that are important in our town. Um, you know, Borough Council went out and, um, and, and Ray, if, if I'm getting off topic here, let me know <laughs> um, that uh, we have, uh, you know, we, we were on the river. You know, we initially had a um, a, a docking system that was basically useless. So the, 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 the borough council got together and, um, and wrote a, you know, a, a series of grants to, um, to improve the wharf and to uh, have better boat access so that people can come off the river and go to the businesses in town. Uh, that was something that, that the, you know, especially the restaurants in town were asking for. We're hoping to use that as a way to initiate, you know, kayak rentals and can have people to come to town because we have a, a you know tourism is kind of like like our little niche you know we have some things in town that can um that can you know that can make that happen so the you know the people at Nemecolon castle uh you know would would like to have more folks come to visit them uh and, and, and from that go to downtown and eat and, and go onto the river and spend a day in Brownsville. um and so we're you know we we listen to the business community in, in that point uh, we had a, a, another uh, member of the community who, um, who, who, who got involved somehow with initial thoughts about a, a new bank coming into town. We haven't had a bank in the borough of Brownsville in decades. Um, and through some commitment on a personal level, uh, we, we think that that's about to happen. Um, you know, we have, uh, you know, we've, we've talked about uh, one of the council members wanted to um, recreate a, an archway that that was was in our downtown area back in the early 1900s. Uh, we some, we secured some grants to to do that. Um, you know we yeah you know, we have you know families in the community, especially in our our, our lower south side, um, whose children didn't have access to playgrounds. Uh, the uh, borough council went out and and they're in the process of securing grants and and putting a playground. Um, you know, downtown again. Uh, that that playground is also next to our little league baseball field, with his, which has just been um, reorganized with a, with a different group of people uh, in in town. Um, we have, uh, like I said, we have uh, you know people from outside the community wanting to come in and and, and help us do things. We are in the middle of. Uh, of trying to acquire funds through an NPP, uh, that, that was really the idea of, of someone, you know, the, the, you know, the, the funding, you know, the acquiring the funding was the idea of someone outside of town, but, um, the people in town, uh, were the ones who decided, you know, when, once we get this funding, if we do, how are we going to put it to use? So it was a combination of, uh, school, uh, you know, and, and, and the, uh, we have a local, um, a local. I don't even know what to call him. Um, a, a local, a local uh, former NFL football player, who has a, uh, a you know, has, has a, a, a space in town where he's doing tremendous work with uh, with with youngsters in our community. Um, you know, as a community, we decided that blight is a problem. We want to spend some some money attacking blight. Uh, you know, so so we have we have taken and 
and talk to you know all community groups in in, in that group the you know the you know, Brownsville Area Revitalization Corporation was was in, was included uh, the historical society is included so so basically what we try to do is is everything that that we try to attempt um, we try to bring somebody from each specific part of the community into the conversation so that you know you, they they might always not always get their way but at least that you know they they their voice is heard um and 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 sometimes you know you, you get what you want and sometimes you don't but it, at least if you're being heard and you're given the opportunity to uh you know to have input i, I we think that that's that's important Joe, so uh, am i Joe, done you have wandered down an amazingly wonderful path Truly, your answer just kind of captured all the aspects that a lot of communities struggle to put together as they look to undertake uh, endeavors that are as significant as what you guys are doing in your downtown. So it's we talked about high level uh, political partners, but then the folks on the ground that you just mentioned, that's that's such an important aspect. And the EPA grant asks you to kind of show your uh, engagement on that fashion. So I'm, I'm going to assume that's your final answer because it was an amazing one. And you get full award of the $900,000. So I think we got one more uh, audience engagement, right, Becca? That's right, Ray. So question number four, when preparing cost estimates for an EPA Brownfields grant, what should be demonstrated in the grant application? Is it showing clarity on how each cost estimate was developed and the extent to which each proposed cost estimate is reasonable and realistic? B, showing that the local, that the project administrative costs will be greater than 5% of the total EPA requested funds. C, by showing the cost estimates are as close as possible to the amount needed or D, all of the above. Man, nobody said there was going to be math involved, did they? Okay. <laughs> all right, let's see what everybody said sharing the results we're kind of split so we'll let you know a is the right answer um, to show clarity on how each cost estimate was developed and the extent to which each proposed cost estimate is reasonable and realistic that kind of goes back to the engagement of those students on the engineering for the building and kind of different aspects. So the more clarity you can bring and the more authentication to the numbers that you're proposing out there, the better off you're going to be in your applications. All right. I think we're at the final question, the million dollar question. <laughs> Though you have not received federal EPA funding, how has your community proven its ability to comply with other federal grant processes? And again, this is one of those questions at the end of the grant application. Show us how you can handle this kind of thing. You guys have touched on a whole bunch of them, but with your final five minutes, give us that aspect of how you've proven that or how you can demonstrate that. Yeah, so, so again, I think um, uh, we've got a pretty tremendous track record in terms of the investment uh, that we've leveraged in Brownsville through uh, both local dollars, state dollars, and federal dollars. Um, so, so primarily on the federal side, a lot of that funding has come through the Community Development Block Grant Program through the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, we've had some investment through the Regional Commission um, some, some of those funding sources. Uh, I mentioned the low-income housing tax credit program, which is um, also federal, um, uh, federally based. Um, so I think we've got a pretty good track record. I think all told, I estimate that just as the Redevelopment Authority, um, through these different sources, we've invested about $10 million in funding um, over the past uh, 15 to 20 years uh, in Brownsville through these different sources. And, and I think we've 
Um, so I think we've demonstrated that we have that, that technical compliance uh, to deal with uh, different governmental um, sources. I think what's more uh, significant too is, um, is the success that we've had just in implementing the projects, regardless of where the funding has come from. Um, you know, we've, we've shown we've had a, a pretty good track record of if we're able to secure the funding, no matter the source, uh, that we're able to take those projects, um, you know, through their completion and, and to be able to successfully complete them and, and implement them. So I think we've got a pretty um, significant track record at that. Um, obviously, we as, again, as the Redevelopment Authority, we represent um, 42 municipalities throughout the county. So we've got a uh, a staff that is dedicated to kind of um, ensuring that compliance uh, with the different state and federal uh, rules. Uh, but also in Brownsville, I think, you know, again, we've we've built a pretty significant team uh, with both the, the local support, uh, but also uh, with Muriel and the work that she does at the chamber. And then we've got, you know, a number of, of other partnering organizations. Joe mentioned the National Road uh, Heritage Corridor uh, that's involved. And uh, there's just a, a slew of other um, organizations that really have uh, have um, led to the success that we've had in Brownsville. And I think I agree with you that throughout this presentation, you guys have demonstrated the engagement of resources and the deployment of resources that that totally spell out uh, the ability to manage your EPA grant and. Uh, Man, just let me check real quick with the judges. Oh, yep, we've got full approval that the million dollar answer was approved and Brownsville, for all intents and purposes, you are Brownsville millionaires. We can, we can feel it, but we need each of you to make your final pitch. So you got like one to two minutes, Joe, one to two minutes. I'm just, just teasing you, my friend, uh, <laughs> to, to give your final pitch on why you guys should be Brownfield millionaires. I'm gonna start with Joe. The short answer, we've done the work. We've, we've, we've done everything that we can. Uh, we need, we need a, a, a massive investment from outside the community. Uh, and, and I think that as, as we see federal dollars going to predominantly larger cities, uh, I think now is a great time for that to be, you know, may, maybe you know, mitigated, and and you know, a, you know, a million dollars to to Brownsville will change the course of the town, as opposed to you know, fifty million dollars in Pittsburgh. Um, that's why I think that uh, the 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 you know we're a great candidate for for receiving federal funds. Great answer. Muriel. I think that rural communities are so vital. And like Joe, you know, often there is, you know, some frustration in watching where dollars go when we know the capacity for change um, that we have in, in this community um, in particular, but some others as well. But I think the most important lesson um, across the board for everyone in going into these kind of projects um, is that the community has to want it. They have to be engaged in it. They have to stand up and say, help us. And then it can move forward. Um, but it has to be, it has to be grassroots and then a, a good team pushing it along. And yeah. we have that in Brownsville. Right. And you can feel it through this call. Andrew, give us the, the final two, bud. Yeah, so I would um, I would uh, ditto ditto what uh, Joe and Muriel said. Um, I would I would just encourage folks. I mean, you you have to be methodical. You've got to kind of think through uh, a lot of these different courses. A lot of the, the the steps that we took were pretty significant, pretty bold. Uh, but but I would say that that's kind of how you need to approach um, approach these things. Sometimes is is you've got to be willing to take that step, that you've got to be willing to dare and, and be aggressive and and kind of think big, dream big, right, uh, with these communities. So sometimes it's, you know, it, it may look like it's overwhelming, but it's one step at a time. And sometimes those are 
again, leaps of faith that you're taking to, to try to make things happen. And, um, and again, I've, you know, I've been, I've been here uh, in Fayette County and working in redevelopment for about 25 years. Uh, and so it hasn't been easy and it's been a long uh, road to, to haul, but, uh, but we've had a lot of success and it's, and it's again, due to the team effort that we have due to the community um, due to people taking ownership and and having pride in, in the place that they live and they call home. And so, um, so again, I'm, I'm proud of the work that we've done in Brownsville and I'd encourage um, everybody who's uh, participating to take a visit to, um, to, to Western Pennsylvania and uh, come see the, the wonderful town that we have in, in Brownsville, PA. Uh, it's a perfect way to end. Great job, you guys. One foot in front of the other, right? That's how we make this work. All right, Becca, I think we got we got three Brownfield millionaires right here. Let's ask some Q&A. We sure do. Uh, before I start reading some questions from the chat, I do have one last Zoom poll to launch uh, before we end, um, just to measure kind of how we're doing um, in helping attendees learn. So if you could just rate your familiarity with the EPA Brownfields grant application. And then there's the second question. If you scroll down, please rate your familiarity with Brownfield redevelopment resources outside of EPA assistance. And then uh, for Brownsville, question from the chat for you. How many people are actively involved in the redevelopment projects in your town? The issue for this person's town is that it's the same small group of people working to do everything and there's just not enough time slash people slash help to work on so many projects. Any advice or suggestions? Okay. Um... I, I did say that I'd, I'd talk to that a, a, a bit, and I, I, I feel your pain. Um, but, you know, it's, let's start there. Um, that is the thing that it, it always seems to be, even with us, and we have a, a, a nice group of people involved. It is the same people uh, who are, you know, who, who are doing a lot of the work. I, I don't know how big, you know, your town is, but there has to be someone who tries to engage. Um, more groups of people. Um, yeah, and, and, and I know that that's not easy because sometimes it's the same people in, in, in the Rotary or in the Eagles Club or the Sons of Italy. Um, what we've done is we've tried to find someone who is connected to each of those groups uh, in a significant way and try to get them to engage with the, uh, you know, with, with their group to get more people involved. Um, that's as, as good as I can do to you know, to help you to 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 get more people actively involved in what's going on. Don't forget your faith based community or your faith based organizations in your communities. Um, from a countywide perspective, a lot of times our faith based organizations get overlooked, and there are a lot of people within those organizations, within those churches, within your ministerial associations that are really worker bees and want to see positive change, but often don't know how to fit into community efforts. So just one extra little bit of advice. Yeah, I, I would also say it's it's nice to have the good story because mm -hmm. there, there were times in our time still probably that there is that core group of small people that are trying to make things happen. Uh, but the more that you can tell the positive story and the more that you have success, the more you're gonna entice other people to come on board. And I think Joe has kind of demonstrated that with the work that he's done, um, just the level of excitement um, that exists out there. I mean, people wanna be a part of something that's fun and exciting and dynamic and things are happening. And so I, I think we've we've seen that. So, so it's recruiting not only, again, those people that are within your community, but there's a lot of people that might be outside of your community that really want to be a part of that success that's occurring. Oh, thank you. Wonderful, wonderful answers. Um, let's see, I think 
I'm going to uh, hand things over to Katie here in just a second. We'll see if any last minute questions pop up in the chat, uh, but we do have uh, contact info in the slides and we'll also be uh, including some highlights from today's presentation and we'll put those in the notes of the slides. So I know Seth has been diligently taking notes and we'll uh, field those answers with our Brownsville team before we send those out. And then I believe Katie, Katie had one last thing um, to wrap us up. I just want to thank everyone. I especially want to thank Brownsville and Ray. I think you did a wonderful job. That Becca, thank you so much for bringing this all together. Definitely want to thank our student who helped prepare the slide deck. I think she did a wonderful job and Seth for um, setting up this idea and strategy. Um, as, as Becca said, we will follow up with a presentation with the slide deck so you can refer to that and also watch the video or share it if you know of anyone who may be interested. And then we also wanted to show you this list of resources on the slide. Um, Brownsville provided that to us. And so that's just to give you an idea um, of, of, again, the resources that they have used and referred to to help in their community. So if you have any other questions, um, I don't think Brownsville would mind if you reach out to them, uh, you know, for some some further follow up or um, some some cheering on. Uh, so please don't hesitate to reach out to them as as well as us here at TAB. And thank you again so much.